critical infrastructures are very complex systems. Look at the airways around the globe. Look at the European high voltage transmission network, power network. Look at the, the Paris subway. Most of the time it's on strike, so it's not really a problem of a complex system. It's another type of problem. There's a structural complexity, an inherent complexity in the system, which comes from the heterogeneity of the components that make the system, different types of systems, hardware, software, social. The scale and dimensionality of the systems and the, the dependencies and interdependencies in and within the systems. And this gives rise to a number of very interesting complex dynamic processes and behaviors, including emergent behavior, adaptive learning, maybe the most common one that we can refer to is cascading failures. Those failures that lead to blackout, okay? The tree that falls on a high voltage line in Switzerland and the blackout that occurs in Italy. Why are we talking about critical infrastructures and why are we talking about resilience of critical infrastructure? Because these infrastructures, as critical as they are, as crucial as they are for our operation, are exposed to a number of hazards and threats, okay? And we're relatively familiar in treating technical failures, component failures, uh, human errors, system agents trying to cope with it through maintenance, natural hazards, but in today's world we're also focusing or facing um, new types of hazards like malevolent attacks and cyber attacks and cyber failures. And these hazards are imposing on these critical infrastructures which are connected and interconnected among themselves. And that's what I was mentioning before where you have a failure in one part of the system that propagates in the system and across the other systems. Is it a relevant problem? Yes, it is. Blackouts, interruptions of transportation are becoming more and more frequent due to various reasons, including extreme weather events. The US recent snowstorm cut the power for a long time, transportation was affected. The uh, uh, weather, harsh weather in France that blocked a number of cities uh, lately and uh, even the risk of flooding of the Seine, which is the river that goes through Paris. So why do we talk about system resilience in the face of this critical infrastructure, their complexity and the hazards that they're exposed to? Well, let me take one step back and tell you about risk assessment, first of all, okay? This is risk assessment. That's what we're doing, risk assessment and management. This is the risk analyst that tries to observe, understand the system to pull out from the pool of hazards and threats as many as he can to protect the system and prevent the occurrence of these hazards and their development into accident scenarios. He's trying to look into this system failure and accident behavior with whatever methods he has, the binoculars, of course through a lot of fuzzy and vague and uncertain information that he can get of this system and does its best, okay, does his or her best to pull out as many as possible extreme events, hazards, human failures, and that's what we do. But as well as we do it, as good as a risk assessor you are, there will always be something left here. So things have happened, typically bad things have happened, and they still will happen. What bad things? These are the hazards and threats that we need to try to find out. How likely, how bad? This is risk assessment, is the exercise of system analysis to answer the questions of what can happen to my system that goes wrong, the accident scenarios, how likely these scenarios can be, and if that happens, what are the consequences, and how bad are the consequences. Then I prepare, I prevent, and try to mitigate. That's risk management. These are the actions that I take to prevent and mitigate the accident scenarios and its consequences. And then there's always surprises. In spite of what we did, something goes, still goes wrong in our systems. 
So when it, go when it goes wrong something, we go back and add an hazard and a threat and protect from them. We eliminate the root cause or add a protection or a mitigation action to not be surprised again by the same type of accident scenario, same hazards and threats. This is the loop of risk assessment and management. Very simple, very clear. Okay? But in addition of trying to preparing and preventing the accidents and trying to mitigate the consequences and then still be surprised, how about responding also to these accidents as well as possible? Let's make the system resilient. So here's resilience as a concept that comes in to complete, in a sense, the picture of risk assessment and management to make our system protected and resilient with respect to uh, accident occurrence. So here you have your system performance. Okay, Here you're doing well, fine. Your plant is producing. Your power network is delivering the or supplying the service. Okay. And then you get a disruption here, okay? a failure into the network, or a failure of a component of your system. And your KPI, your key performance indicator, your production, whatever that is, your service goes down. And then it stays down until you finally are ready to start recovering the system because you're repairing the component, because you're managing the crisis and the emergency, and you start recovering your performance okay, back to normal. Okay? Resilience wants to look at the whole thing, adding the aspects of recovery to the aspect of trying to identify what can happen and mitigate the immediate consequence. So it adds the aspect of recovery in particular, okay, into the picture of what was before the risk assessment and management. So it looks at the whole thing. Your performance, the accident scenario, the likelihood of the scenario, the consequence of the scenario with respect to a certain threshold, the consequence of the scenario, the drop in your performance. That's risk assessment. Scenarios, likelihood, probability, consequence. Okay? The difference between the Performance, the, the, let's say the, the uh, stable performance of the system, the nominal performance of the system, and the lower level that you reach due to the disruption. This is your measure of robustness. If your performance drops only a little, you're robust. If it, perform if it drops a lot, you're not robust. The scenario, the likelihood, the consequence, the, the robustness, the time that it takes to recover, and let's say how much you recover, that's resilience. It enlarges the scope of your analysis. It enlarges the focus and the picture of your quantification. Up to here, with risk assessment and management, we're doing fine. Okay? We need to find out how to measure the additional aspects of recovery, let's say, okay, of your system. So robustness and recovery come into the picture as an additional aspect of resilience. This is conceptually you say, interesting. Okay. Now the point is, how do I operationalize this with respect to assessing how a, resilient, a system is resilient with respect to another. What is the level of resilience of my system? Is it resilient enough? Enough with respect to what criterion? And if I decide it is not resilient enough, what do I do to make it resilient? How do I optimize resilience? How do I take decision driven by my resilience measures? So let me introduce the resilience assessment framework, okay, the overall framework around resilience, which is again very uh, intuitive, I would say. We will need to model the system response to disruption. In our case, critical infrastructure CIs. We need to model, okay, based on physical uh, laws, 
data driven, as we were discussing earlier, okay, we need to find a way to model the behavior of the system upon disruptions, okay, and throughout the cycle of disruption. Uh, we need to use that model to quantify resilience. That's a beautiful curve that you showed, Professor Zio. How, how do you quantify? So we need to introduce metrics that capture this disruption, its likelihood, its consequence, the mitigation of the consequences, the recovery. Okay? We need to find what are the main elements that I can act on and change the resilience of my system that either reduce or mitigate the consequence, that speed up the recovery. I need to find in my system what are the resources that I can allocate in order to do something on the resilience, improve the resilience. And eventually, I want to change this decision variables, okay, these characteristics of my system with respect to its response to the disruption, so that it's resilient okay? in all the aspects that I have, and I can play with it to make it resilient, mitigating the consequences, speeding up the recovery, preventing the scenarios. It's all included. So we need a resilience matrix. And given the, the heat of the topic, there's been a lot of metrics that have been proposed in the literature. I will not be able to cover all. I will give you a couple of examples that relate to different types of approaching the problem, okay? Because the metrics can have different characteristics and uh, sometimes it depends on the application, sometimes it depends on the system, sometimes it depends on the data and information that you have that enables you to characterize more or less the resilience of the system. And you need to sort of match the formulation of your metric with what you know, okay? Are you going to account for, or can you account for the uncertainty in the development of the accident scenario because you don't know when it happens, you're not exactly modeling precisely the consequence, you don't know the uh, repair rate of the components, okay? So you can approach the problem probabilistically or just deterministically. And you can define a deterministic resilience matrix or probabilistic resilience matrix. Are you accounting and are you following in time the drop in your performance function and the recovery or are you integrating the overall behavior? Okay, dynamic, static, okay. Uh, what application are you trying to uh, define specifically a resilience matrix for your power grid and therefore, you need to refer to uh, expected energy not supplied, okay? Uh, performance indicators typical of the power network, or you want to give it a more structural based description with respect to the structure of the system and the disruption in terms of the disruption and effects on the structure. So you get generic or structural based methods. And then how do you compute? What formula do you use? And you'll see that we can do some ratio-based metrics where we divide uh, some quantities to give a, a percentage type resilience or a zero one resilience metric or you integrate uh, over the horizon of the recovery of the functioning of the system. So first example that we mentioned actually earlier I think too, Henry, Henry and Ramirez Marquez, okay, the resilience at the given time t, okay, as the effect of the disruptive event is running from the initial value p of t0 up to the lowest value that you reach due to the disruption p at td, okay, that resilience value is a function of time and it is the ratio between the difference of your value of the curve at a given time t, okay, and the minimum value divided by the maximum drop that you can have, p of t0, which is the nominal value, and ptd, which is the minimum value reached. Okay, that's a way of measuring in time, okay, in time, dynamically, the resilience of the system, okay. is the ratio of the recovered performance Okay, mitigated and recovered performance, okay? Here you're mitigating and here you're recovering, okay? 
uh, with respect to the total loss of the system from the function to the minimum value. Okay? It's a typical deterministic dynamic, because it moves in time, ratio based approach. Okay? And interestingly, upon disruption in certain cases, you might actually recover to a higher performance than before. Lots of people say that crises are great opportunities. Okay, usually those are the ones that play in finance and have enough money that they weren't touched by crisis and exploit the crisis moment to make even more money, okay, for whatever ethical that is. But in principle, you touch the bottom and you start increasing and maybe the solution that you uh, arrive at is better than before. Okay, so P of T at one point could be larger than the initial performance and therefore RT could be even greater than one. This is one way of describing dynamically as time goes by the variation of your performance and capturing it into a ratio-like formula for expressing the resilience of your system. Another approach is to take in a normalized uh, measure of your performance, zero, one, the area of this, of this uh, part of the resilience function profile, okay? Where again, you drop, okay? And then you start recovering, and the recovery, it's linear, linearized, and it lasts like this, and this is the maximum allowed, let's say, uh, it's the, the maximum expected bound on time to recover. It's a constraint. You need to recover before this time, okay? So you take the, really the ratio of the, of the triangular area over the whole blue area, okay? And this gives you an integrated measure of system resilience. If the triangle area is smaller, either because this is shorter or this is quicker, then you're more resilient. Okay? If you don't recover anything until you drop down all the way and then suddenly you recover everything, then you're very little resilient. You're not resilient at all. Okay, you're not reacting to the disturbance. So it's again a ratio-based approach. It's deterministic, it's static, it's not dependent on time. It considers the time horizon of the recovery and the time horizon, the acceptable time horizon for the recovery, okay? It does consider the whole loss of performance and uh, again, the time of, of recovery. Another one, just to give you a different flavor, it's a probabilistic one. A probabilistic one, again, got your performance, you got the maximum accepted drop in performance from any disruption. You got the maximum acceptable duration of your recovery. And resilience is measured as the probability that the actual maximum drop, which occurs at the beginning, that's an assumption, and the actual time of recovery, okay, respectively, the maximum drop that occurs is larger than the acceptable, okay, the maximum acceptable loss, and the time of recovery is smaller than the maximum time allowed. It's a probabilistic measure, okay, it considers uncertainty, and it takes into account, again, both the loss of performance and the recovery. But it's probabilistic. It accounts for the fact that you don't know exactly when the scenario will occur. You don't know how much will be the impact. You don't know how fast will be the start of the recovery and the recovery itself and when it will end. So there's a probabilistic model which is embedded or enveloping, if you wish, your deterministic model of the response of your system. Okay. Now that we have resilience metrics, 
before we go out and celebrate, we need to use it. Okay? We use it to assess the resilience of my system. Okay? So we really need to do a system analysis okay, to evaluate quantitatively the resilience of, of the system with respect to whatever hazards and threats we are uh, considering. Okay? So we need to, first of all, define and, s and, and, and characterize both the system and the hazard. And this, in practice, is a very fundamental step of your analysis. Okay? What are the boundaries of your system? What are the characteristics of your hazard? Okay? Then you need to describe means model quantitatively eventually, okay, the vulnerability of your system components. Okay? Let's say the fragilities of your components if you want to talk it in terms of structures. Okay? The fragilities of the components as opposed to different magnitudes and different characteristics of the hazards and threats. Okay? With these you can put them in your system and see how it reacts on this type of hazards and threats that you have characterized, defined, and that meet the components which are more or less vulnerable and react in certain ways to this load and stress and, and hazard, and therefore you get the system reaction. The system reaction will tell you, in particular, how the performance is going down due to the event of disruption. But that's not the end. This would be basically you know, system risk assessment. You also have to worry about modeling how the components are recovered and consequently how the system is restored to different levels of functioning until the previous nominal value or even higher. If we think that we actually recover even better than before. So here's a scheme of uh, these steps where you describe the system okay, that you're analyzing for your resilience uh, assessment. You describe the hazards. And every time you're answering a question, okay, resilience of what? what? What is my system? Where is the boundary stopping? Okay, do I include also the roads that come in to include what interconnections and interfaces with other systems. Okay? What resilience to what? Okay? Specify the hazards, characterize it physically. The component models and the hazard models, because they have to meet, and then the effect is going to come from the combination of the, of the attack from the hazard or threat and the component fragility model. Okay? And then you got your system model that through the hazard impact evaluation tells you what is the system disruption level. You're modeling the component repairs. Okay? And this go back to give you eventually the system resilience evaluation. Okay? Depending on how and how much you uh, repair your component and how the system functions, then your resilience curve will look more or less deep, more or less steep in the recovery phase. And you got to put something in all these boxes. Okay? You got to put something in all these boxes. You got to describe the system, you got to describe the hazard, you go to the, your uh, wonderful meteorological center that you have, which I learned it's top of the country, so probably top of the world. Okay? And you ask them, say, okay, storms, how is it coming? What are the characteristics? Spatial, speed, so on. You got to characterize that because then you know your fragility models, your fr the fragility of your components, okay? you model them. Okay? The definition of fragility curves is a fundamental activity in all risk assessments against, in particular, extreme events, natural events. Okay? Earthquake engineering is based on that. Okay? Um, and then you got your system physical operation, because if it's a power grid, then you got to have the power flowing according to Kirchhoff's law. So you got to have a DC or AC flow model. 
that simulates what's happening in the system now that this high voltage line has gone down and the energy is redistributed and you got interdiction and so on, okay? And so you define also the specific system level performance indicator, the function that's dropping. For example, the energy that's supplied or unsupplied, okay? And then eventually you put in your resilience matrix and you say something about resilience. A value of zero, one, depending if you got an integrated dynamic, ratio-based, probabilistic, deterministic. That depends on what you're using. And what you're using depends on what you know that, and what data and information you have that can characterize the resilience of your system through these blocks. Okay? So that's what uh, expect us when we don't want to do a resilience assessment, okay? Uh, where the resilience metric is only one part, one uh, part that captures the system behavior, which however it's pushed by the characteristics of the system and the system and, and the, um, of the hazards, okay? The challenges are, as usual, I would say in risk assessment, but even more so in uh, resilience, the difficulty of having information and data to characterize precisely the hazards, to characterize precisely the system behavior in terms of the vulnerabilities and fragilities of its components, and perhaps more so, the restoration characteristics at the components level and at the effects at the uh, system level. And even more so, if considering types of hazards and threats that are extremely rare and have very peculiar characteristics. The uh, extreme disasters, earthquakes, extreme weather, uh, extreme snowstorms, extreme thunderstorms are rare. They're becoming a little bit too frequent lately due maybe to climate change or so on, okay? But are, you know, relatively rare. The threats, the malevolent attacks, are difficult to model. Okay, you got not so much information. Probably this information is not so public because these are uh, malevolent attacks, so there is a, 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 a problem of security of society and police-like uh, problems, so you don't have easy access to this data. And then the model that you make must not be rational because or, or, or must be a different rationality because somebody that wants to damage something is probably not our rationality. We want, we want the system to perform as, as best as possible. We don't want to damage the system. So it's hard to model the behavior of an attacker. Okay? So there's a challenge in the res resilience assessment. As logic and intuitive as it seems, there are significant modeling challenges in this problem. At the end of the course, you will know how to do it. Not this class, but the whole course, okay? So let's suppose that we are at the end of the course, okay? You're already taking the exam. You've, of course, you all got brilliant votes, uh, brilliant notes or marks, as I expect. So what do we do with the capability of measuring, assessing the resilience of a, of a system? Well, we like to take decisions, I mean, uh, we have resources and we can apply different resilience strategies um, emphasizing the prevention of the accidents or uh, emphasizing the mitigation of its consequences or focusing on quick recovery strategies or any combination of this with given resources, okay? And depending on the choice that we make, we get different resilience responses we can get, you know, a, a little resilient system, but if we apply with the proper strategy, the proper resources, we can actually improve our resilience, okay? Either uh, reducing the drop in performance or speeding up the uh, recovery. And our matrix will tell us if our decisions on how to allocate the resources to protect, prevent, mitigate and recover are doing a good reduction or an acceptable reduction. So 
So we are using our assessment okay, that we eventually condense and lump in the resilience matrix to decide, to decide on emergency measures, on protection measures, on recovery measures. Okay? There's a number of things that we can do. Remember that our systems are heterogeneous. They're physical components where, for example, we can put redundancies. Okay? We're rich and we put two pumps in our plant, four engines in our airplane. Okay? Multiple connecting lines to deliver our service or our energy to the customer or to the load, to the consumer. This is physical, fine. But there's also human operators, there's also decision makers. So you've got to work also on that, both to prevent accidents and also to mitigate the consequences and also to recover. So work on awareness. One of the big issues in safety in general is safety culture, okay? Resilience culture. People be prepared, people at all levels, from the operator to the community to the emergency services. Be aware, share information, integrate decision makings, okay? Distribute the decision making of different actors eventually must come together so that the solution of the crisis is positive for everybody, okay? We said there's interdependent networks. So big discussion we're having. Do we start and speed up the recovery on the electrical power grid or on the transportation network or on the water or do we switch from one to the other because actually if I want to recover the power network, I need the workers to go there and be able to do go there. But if the roads are not working, how do I do that? Take the Fukushima accident in the nuclear uh, technology, okay? Big accident, we all know about it. One of the problems was that it, it just was, you, couldn't, you, didn't have, you did not have access to the plant. So to put water in this hot nuclear stuff, you had to shoot water from the boats, from the ships, actually, outside on the, on, in the sea, okay? Because you couldn't get there. Because the earthquake actually damaged the whole transportation network, okay? Uh, so decision-making distributed and Cooperative, in a sense, is fundamental. Train staff and management. Okay, harden system components, redundancy, or make it better so that they're less vulnerable. Okay. Nowadays, uh, the vulnerability to earthquakes, for example, in Italy, it's a big, big problem. Okay, and people are rebuilding what has been destroyed, of course, with better concepts, better material, to make them harder than before, less vulnerable than before. If you can adjust the network system, the critical infrastructure, to avoid areas of uh, potential vulnerability, okay? And so on, deploy backup systems, optimize the repair sequences, okay? Of course, the resilience strategy that optimally combines all these opportunities to improve resilience becomes then system specific, budget constrained, and so on. Very difficult optimization problem. You gotta have somebody like Andreas to solve it. And then define these this strategies over the evolution of the accident. You can, you can act to avoid and improve the resilience, avoiding the events, avoiding the accidents, or optimizing solutions when the accident occurs in terms of mitigating the consequences and uh, recovering the system. So, one example that is looked at very much in the literature, okay, becomes a tri-level optimization problem, okay, where you have basically, you're trying to protect your system. If you look at it in terms of a, a threat, or if you want, you could see also the hazard from a, a, an extreme weather event as, a, as an attacker, it, it's, it's attacking your your system is not a rational attacker, but it's attacking, attacking your system. So you want to maximize protection, okay? Uh, the attacker wants to maximize the damage to your protection, 
right? And eventually, the operator of the system again wants to maximize the recovery of your system. So you need to formulate the optimization problem along the domain of development of the axiom, which has clear different phases, okay? And the operator is defending, if you wish, the designer and operator is defending the system, is making it more resilient, is defending it against and before the event occurs, and is defending it and recovering when it occurs. The attack, the hazard, is trying to damage it, okay? Maybe the hazard is not trying to damage it. I don't think that the snowstorm has an intention to really hurt you. It just happens, okay? But that's what it is. And then you, def you define this problem, and again, you define it deterministically or probabilistically, depending on how you describe the system behavior and therefore the resilience metric. And then you can take different approaches of solution if you probabilistically, including also maybe a robust optimization, okay? Uh, and this is an example where you see the um, choices that are made by the defender pre-event, but the disrupted agent attacks these links, and therefore now the operator must decide how to recover promptly and effectively the network based on what happened in spite of what was attacked, in spite of the preventive measurement uh, the preventive protection barriers that were put uh, at the design stage, let's say, okay? You must model that and optimize it, okay? So in your system, when you're setting up your defenses, your resilience uh, barriers, your resilience enhancements, okay, you must define what can you do. I can add redundancy. I can share information. I can make the managers and the staff resilient, aware, okay? And in your model, you must say, how do I show that? If I put a redundancy, what parameter changes? So you must have a formulation, okay? Don't worry about this meaning, specific meaning of the formula, okay? I had to put it to look like I'm a professor for real, okay? But it's important that you show that upon making this enhancement action, my model parameter could be the recovery rate increases, okay? My parameter that defines the drop in performance decreases. Of how much? You must model that and you may, must get data and functional forms that make sense with respect to the practical application. And then you must model the cost of it, okay? There's no free lunch, as they say, except if you're invited for a lecture. That's a good uh, learning here. Uh, there's no free lunch, so whatever action you take, the action will have a cost, okay? And you need to account for that because you got limited resources in terms of budget, uh, budget for uh, implementing them. So once you have that, okay, you have your measure of resilience. Don't worry about it, okay? Integrals look good, okay? Sums also. Measure of resilience or non-resilience, if you look at it, one minus the resilience, okay? And the cost of implementing. So for this, diff you will have different behavior of the resilience depending on the decisions that you made of which activity and which actions to implement to enhance resilience, which is translated in the modification of your parameter, which gives you a different system response, which is measured by the resilience. And it has a cost associated to it. And what you're doing here, you're trying to find the best allocation of uh, actions in the pre-event or in the prevention and mitigation phase, prevent prevention phase, in the post-events or mitigation and recovery phase, you want to model them properly by changes in parameter, and you want to find the optimal with respect to the most resilient I can get my system with the minimum cost, okay? Multi-objective optimization. Other ways to do it is to, to define a single objective optimization and put constraint on the other objectives. 
Okay? I want to maximize resilience, and my budget is this. So you apply to the system, okay? For example, this is a simplified example of a system of systems because it's a gas generation and transmission or distribution network, which, by the way, distributes gas to some consumers that have a certain demand that can be fi fixed or variable or uncertain. Big issue today, gas transmission reliability and resilience of gas transmission systems, okay? including demand management side. Demand management is a big issue also in electricity. Okay, You need to satisfy demand. You need to predict demand. You need to predict generation. You need to match the two. Okay? Gas, but this gas goes also to a power grid because it, it powers the turbo machines of the electrical power generators, which then are connected to an electrical grid that has electricity users. You want to satisfy the demand of electricity and the demand of gas. You can have failures in the components and in the lines, the pipelines of gas and the electrical cables of the uh, electricity network, okay? You have a number of possible activities that you can do to enhance your system, resilience, including redundancies, including improvements of recoveries. We have identified the most important activities by sensitivity analysis. You know which parameters, these are the parameters of the model that are affected by these activities. You know the cost of these activities. Put all that in the big pot of your resilience model and your optimization. And you pull out, for example, what is called the Pareto optimal front, where here you have the non-resilience increasing. So the most resilient solutions are these. No, are these, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, no, I'm, I'm right, I'm this, okay. Small resilience, small no resilience means high resilience, but they are the most costly. And then you go to the decision maker and says, here's the solution. Decide which one you like better among these. These are Pareto optimal. These are the best solutions uh, in terms of both objectives. It's up to you. You got money? Take the best, most resilient solution. You don't have money? That's the cheapest. You get a compromise solution, typically where the elbow is, because moving from one to the other, it will cost you too much or you will lose too much resilience. That's where the slope starts. Okay. That's classical optimization, multi-object optimization, with eventually the decision making on the Pareto optimal solution. So now we almost can celebrate, okay? Now we get these three solutions, okay? The most resilient one, but very expensive, okay? The least resilient, cheap, but not very resilient, and a compromise solution. And then you decide. You can see the effect of the solution. You can decide, OK? You got the uh, integrated value of your resilience matrix. You got your cost. Okay, The decision maker takes the decision. Okay, when you, be, when you graduate from here, you'll be rich and famous decision makers. You will decide on your resilient systems. Don't forget us, so you can give us contracts to keep modeling these things, OK? So let me come to the conclusion. We have introduced a new paradigm to look at the problem of accidents in our systems. We have extended the view of risk assessment and management. We have realized that we cannot protect from any, everything. We cannot prevent all that may occur that we don't like in a system. And that it's smart to try to look at the overall picture so that we can use our resources best to prevent and protect, but also to mitigate and to recover. This is 
as I said at the beginning, pretty rational. Sounds very good. It comes to a cost. The cost is we need to expand our ways of modeling the system. We need to know more. We need to be able to put more in our models. And eventually, we need to take the right decisions on how to make our system resilience based on our model. For this, there are various resilient metrics, right? which is good. Okay? Researchers have worked quite a bit in expanding this framework and providing the metrics to use. Use the one that fits your problem, meaning the aim of your assessment and decision making, and the information and data and knowledge that you have to characterize the problem, which is characterize the hazards, characterize the system, model the system response, which comes through the modeling of the response of the component, of the vulnerability of the component, and their response to the hazard. Keep in mind this very system analysis point of view because it's strong, and it will allow you to handle these problems in a robust way. This is the resilience assessment framework. Okay, you arrive at the optimization thanks to that. Okay, pre-disruption strategies optimization or restoration planning optimization or both. Just look at the problem and use the opportunities of preventing and protecting a lot, or and or restoring quickly and or mitigating. Find the optimal solution with the mathematical frame, I would say the systemizes framework that encapsulate all the aspects of the problem and the mathematical modeling framework which gives you the scientific solidity to really give some engineering solution to the problem. It's a very active research field. Professor KB is a leading figure here. And I'll take the opportunity to thank him for this great opportunity to come here. And I thank you all for the uh, attention, and I hope you appreciate it. I put my Clemsonist tie for you for the colors of Oklahoma University. Thank you very much. <laughs>